things he hath done. All right, great singing this morning. You may be seated. Dr. Carter, if you will come and present for us this morning. Good morning, everybody. I am Dr. Robert Carter with Creation Ministries International. It is such a pleasure to be here after so many delays with sickness and disease and world events. But happily, that is now behind us. We look forward to normality, hopefully, in the near future. Um, I have three totally different presentations for you this morning, three completely different subjects. Some of them I'm an expert in, and tonight we're going to back from dinosaurs. I'm not a paleontologist, but I love dinosaurs, so we're just going to have some fun talking about some interesting things and asking some questions that we may or may not be able to answer. For this morning, though, we're going to pack some fascinating ideas into two different gospel lectures, and the next one's going to have a lot more gospel in it. No, that's not true. This one's got a good gospel appeal at the end, too. Okay. My point here is not to talk about science. If I was just doing that, I'd be wasting my time. My point here is to point people towards Jesus Christ. Now, how well we can do that with this subject Let's see. A lot of what I'm about to present to you has already appeared in Creation Magazine, or it's on the pages of our, our website, creation.com. So when we're done, you're still going to have some more questions. I would encourage you to go to those two places, ask questions, and see if they can be answered. I cannot possibly address every aspect of this question of race in 45 minutes, but I'm going to do as best I can. Now, I'm a huge fan of history. I love studying my own family history. That is the uh, world's fanciest cruise ship. Can you see it? It's actually lying on its side. This is 1942 in the Brooklyn Naval Yard. The SS Normandy was one of the most luxurious ships ever made, and it was trapped here at the beginning of World War II. So the US government bought it, and they were transforming it into a troop transport to bring our soldiers over to England for the invasion of Normandy. Well, it caught fire and the French fire hoses didn't fit the American fire hoses, so they couldn't hook up the fire system for the ship, but the fire ships could spray water on it only from one side, and they end up rolling the ship. Well, the reason I show you that is because my grand grandfather was on board this ship when it caught fire. He was a longshoreman in New York City. Whew, what a tough old man he was, but he got burned along with a lot of other people, and he was condemned, not condemned, commended, <laughs> sorry, commended <laughs> for running in and out of the ship and grabbing hurt men and dragging them out before they died. But he got burning tar dripped all over his head and back, and he was so scarred he couldn't work anymore, so he spent the rest of his time as a New York City cab driver. I'm driving toward human history here. Fascinating anecdotes. Just down the street, literally, from the Brooklyn Labor Yard is this beautiful row of brownstones, one of the most iconic blocks in um, all of American architecture. I took that picture because I had this picture. I had to find this place. That is my grandmother, that pudgy little girl in the middle there. That's my great-grandfather, her great, sorry, her grandfather, her step-grandmother, and her step-aunt, I guess, on that corner. My great-great-grandfather, an immigrant from Friesland, that's the northern Netherlands, built that row of brownstones, and they live there. Now, the, uh, one of the brothers absconded with the money, so you know, <laughs> a lot of stories in the family. Another branch of my family. This is my mother's father, is the boy in the middle of that picture. This is on Jekyll Island, Georgia. Have you ever heard of the creature from Jekyll Island? It's called the Federal Reserve. Yeah, it, that plat, well, plot was hatched on Jekyll Island, and my family was there as servants. This is on the far right. This is Torkel Torkelson. Don't laugh. He was born in Norway in 1865, emigrated to New York City, found a much younger <clears throat> bride, Lizzie Gorman, who was born in a tenement in the slum and uh, prostitute and lice-infested uh, western side of Manhattan. Her parents were Irish potato famine immigrants. They got married and moved to Jekyll Island, where hobnobbing with the richest people in the world. In fact, my grandfather's middle name is Edwin, after Edwin Gould, the railroad tycoon. 
but uh, Torkel there on the far right is dying of tuberculosis. The little girl in the stroller wasn't going to make it to the next census, and she was the second girl named Jenny. The two boys on the left would die of tuberculosis soon after their father, and the mother, penniless, went back to New York City. That's cool. The human condition is amazing. But I can't go any further back than this. That's all the pictures I have. Now, I know where they came from, a lot of things. So, you know, being that I'm a nerd, give me Google Earth and geography and genealogy. You know, I'm going to draw lines on the map where all my people were born and connect them to where their people were born. So that's where my people came from. Is that a surprise? I mean, look at me. What area of the world did my ancestors come from? Take a guess. Not just Europe, Northern Europe. I'm a typical Northern European male. How can you do that? I mean, as you were all walking in, I'm looking at you and I'm, I'm guessing what your ancestry is. African, European, Native American, Asian, I, mean, I do it all the time. But how is it that we can look at a person and say, oh, you're from that place in the world if we all came from Adam and Eve just a few thousand years ago? That's an honest question, right? How do we get races? Well, we now have to get into the subject of genetics. In, for me, I had a hard time deciding what I wanted to do in college. I loved history and I loved biology. So I, I took biology. And then I ended up getting a PhD in biology, but I ended up in genetics. And genetics is the study of how traits are passed from one generation to the next. So it's the science of history. And I got to weld these two things together. Now I was, you know, theoretically a coral reef ecologist, scuba diving in Florida and the Bahamas and the Belize for years and years and years. It was a tough life. <laughs> but I ended up in the genetics lab, and when I stole the genes that code for these bright green and bright red proteins in these animals and engineered them into these animals, that's when I got my PhD. So yeah, I made the Frankenfish. And that opens up a giant can of worms. Is that moral? Can we do things like this? Can we literally monkey around with God's creation and God will be pleased with this? But that is a subject for another day. Genetic engineering is a uh, terrifically complicated and emotionally laden and morally problematic field. I'm just gonna leave that with you. There's, uh, oh, by the way, at our creation conference in Myrtle Beach uh, this May, at the end of the, uh, end of the month, I'm going to be doing, for the first time, a talk on genetic engineering. So you have to come hear that one if you like. I am a practicing scientist. Um, even, even after coming to work for CMI, I published several papers. This is a, a paper I published on mitochondrial Eve. The evolution has talked about mitochondrial Eve all the time, but we went and figured out what her mitochondrial genome would have been and published it in an evolutionary journal, Nucleic Acids Research. Here's another one, a new look at an old virus. We're looking at the human H1N1 influenza virus that killed so many people at the end of World War I, and we tracked mutations over time, and we showed a relentless, non-stoppable accumulation of bad mutations. In other words, natural selection doesn't work, and we published that also. Okay, that's just some of my background. Let's look at some biblical problems now. If you just look at um, you know, any number of websites, I pulled this from uh, the U.S. Census website. This is a chart of population size throughout world history. Notice that the line goes way back before the time when the Bible says the earth was created. How old is the earth is an excellent question. Did we evolve from monkeys? Did we come from some you know, small population in Africa, those are, those are, I don't believe those things, but those are questions that need to be asked. And if you look at any of the secular presentations, they're going to give you deep time and long ages. But looking at this, first of all, there's almost no evidence for that. If there was, let's say, a million human beings on the earth for like a million years, um, there would have been like a couple of trillion dead bodies. Where are they? That's a great question. There is actually no evidence that lots of people lived for a very long time. We could take all the ancient bones that we found and put them into a van. 
They used to say a trunk of a car, but they found many thousands more since then. But they're not that many people in history. Not only that, looking at this, if you just started with Adam and Eve, 4,000, sorry, let's start with Noah, not Adam and Eve. Let's start with Noah, 4,500 years ago. Noah and his wife, the Bible says, from Shem, Ham, and Japheth, from these three, all the peoples of the earth were descended. Could we start with three couples, six people, 4,500 years ago, and get seven billion people today? Actually, yeah, well, what happened to my chart? I thought I put my chart in there. If you do that math, and you only double the population every 150 years, which is ridiculously slow. I've got four kids. I doubled my population. My wife and I, we doubled our population in just um, eight years. It's easy to double populations. Human populations grow very, very, very quickly. And if you start 4,500 years ago, at the end of that, that red circle, and double the population every 150 years, you get seven billion people. So the number of people in the world is trivial to explain in a biblical timeline. But what is the biblical timeline? Here I'm, I'm rounding off all the numbers to nice, easy to understand numbers. Creation was a little bit more than 4,000 BC. I answered that in a, an article called The Biblical Minimum Maximum Age of the Earth. My co-author and I, we went through all the parts of the Bible that we, you need to use to put together how old the earth is. And we said, okay, here's a number. But, you know, um, Seth is born when Adam is 130 years old. But probably not on his birthday. It's somewhere during that year. So every statement like that is plus or minus six months of accuracy. Oh, so we added up all of that, and we got a range of about 200 years. We couldn't even get it to, you know, 7,000 B.C. We could not be anywhere close to 10,000 B.C., but it's just a little more than 4,000 B.C. But if that's true, creation's about 4,000 B.C. The flood's about 1,600 years later. Abraham, interesting, lived about 2,000 B.C. Moses, about 1,500 B.C. David, Solomon, that's right about 1,000 B.C. Jesus, of course, is at year zero, even though there is no year zero. And today we're about 2,000 A.D. The Bronze Age. You've heard of the, the Bronze Age, right? That's biblical. That's the time of Moses. Abraham lived during the Chalcolithic, which is the Copper Age. David lived in Iron Age too. Oh, these ages aren't thousands of years long. They're, depending on where you are in the world, some places skipped over an entire age because a new technology just came through from some other culture. But in general, in the Middle East, they're a couple centuries long, maybe. Age is a strange word for them to use. Here's the Battle of Troy. It's in the biblical time frame. The Peloponnesian Wars. The whole thing with Queen Esther and her king and, you know, the, the, the 300. That's all late in biblical history. All right. Oh, there's my, that's the chart I wanted. I don't know why I got it out of order. If you start with six people 4,500 years ago and simply double the population every 150 ridiculously slow years, you can get the number of people alive today. That's not a challenge biblically. Ah, but there are some other challenges. This is Dr. Francis Collins. He ran the Human Genome Project. He just retired as the director of the National Institutes of Health. The Christianity Today wrote an article called The Search for the Historical Adam, and they said this, talking about his uh, book, The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. He reported scientific indications. Oh, wait a second. This is a Christian, he claims to be an evangelical Christian, very high-ranking scientist. He's about to present to you evidence for why he believes the Bible. What do you think he's going to say? Well, he reported scientific indications that anatomically modern humans emerged from primate ancestors. What? Perhaps 100,000 years ago, long before the Genesis time frame, and originated with a population number something like 10,000, not two, individuals. What are those numbers? What's that 10,000? What's that 100,000? That's a straight up evolutionary out of Africa theory. When the evolutionary community discovered that there's only one female ancestor of all humans that are alive today, 
That was a mystery. That wasn't supposed to be true. But they said, well, how do we explain it? Oh, oh, you see, if the entire earth actually was, oh, sorry, if the entire human population on earth was very small, eventually it's going to end up that there's one lady who is the, the great, 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 great grandmother of everyone alive. It works like this. Let's say the rest of the world is suddenly killed off in some big zombie apocalypse, and we're the only people left. And it's up to us to repopulate the world. Any man that does not have a son, his Y chromosome is extinct. Right? Any woman who doesn't have a daughter, her mitochondria is not passed on to the next generation. Same thing happens with last names. If we keep, keep the traditional Christian way of a woman, it's not any Christian, the traditional English way of a woman taking on her husband's last name. Uh, by the way, it's not true in Norway and it's not true in the Netherlands. A woman kept her name, which makes a great thing for genealogy. My Norwegian family tree, my Dutch family tree goes way back. My English family tree hits a brick wall because the females, their, their names, it's their husband's name. I don't know who they are. Okay, anyway. If we were to repopulate the world very quickly, there'd only be one last name in our population. It might take 10 generations, but it's going to happen unless our population grows very quickly. Because as the population grows, it's more likely that a man's gonna have a son that survives, who carries on the last name and the Y chromosome. It's more likely that a woman's gonna have daughters but the population stays small, the family tree gets pruned very quickly. And that's what they're saying. If there was 10,000 people, which is a lot of people, for a vast period of time, maybe a million years, maybe hundreds of thousands of years at least, eventually, mathematically, just by dumb luck, there's only going to be one mitochondrial line. This is a problem for them, and they don't want to admit it because there are about 10,000 cheetahs in the wild today, and all the wildlife ecologists think that cheetahs are going to go extinct. There's not enough of them. They're breeding themselves out of existence. Birth defects are increasing, reproductive incompatibilities are increasing, litter sizes are decreasing, cheetahs are in big trouble because 10,000 individuals is not enough to sustain a viable vertebrate population. This is why Bigfoot does not exist. Sorry, I might have stepped on someone's toes there. <laughs> it's impossible to have a large vertebrate with a s small reproductive capacity survive in a small population. And the evolutionists, that's why they have 10,000, because they know that anything less than that, we're doomed. Okay. Collins has said something like this. There's no way, talking about all, like I'll call the variation amongst us in this room right here, there's no way you can get this much variation in just a few thousand years from one or two ancestors. D D uh, Dennis Venema, another PhD Christian professor at a college, said, you'd have to postulate there's this been this astronomically, sorry, there's been this absolutely astronomical mutation rate that has produced all these new variants in an incredibly short period of time. Those types of mutation rates are just not possible. It would mutate us out of existence. So looking at all the seven billion people in the world, look at all the genetic variation that we have. Is it true that if all that variation was mutation, we would, have to, we would go extinct with that much mutation rate? Yeah, that is true. But what are they ignoring? They're ignoring the fact that God could have put genetic variation into Adam. Why would he not? He, they're assuming Adam was created with exactly the same letters on all the chromosomes. Uh, that's really usually bad. People that have very low genetic diversity are usually not very healthy because, you know, your mom and dad were sisters, brother and sister, something like that. That's usually not good for you. So here's a challenge. Can we get 30 million or so genetic variations across the world if we just start with Adam? The answer is no, unless God plants into Adam genetic diversity. So I published a paper at the uh, last International Conference of Creationism. We wanted to address this. This curve is the, all the mutations that I found in the Thousand Genomes Project on human chromosome 22. 
And why do I use 22? Because the smallest chromosome. There's already you know, a couple of million letters there, and it was really hard to analyze it, but just that chromosome. And what we see is there's a lot on the left there, a lot of very rare genetic variants. They're only found in one person, one tribe, in one country. Most of the genetic variants are rare. This is something that just appeared like, sir, you have mutations that your parents did not have. Do you know that? Every person in this room, you've got about 100 letter differences between you and mom and dad. Those are mutations that happened in you in the womb. So if you have a bunch of things no one else has, think of all the things in this room that no one else in the world has. That's all the stuff on the left. It's one person divided by 7 billion people. The frequency is, is way off to the left. There's a few things that are off to the right here, then 30, 40, 50% of the population. So maybe like one of these letters is really common in China. So 30% of the world population carries that letter, something like that. But if we started with just Adam, Adam is two of each chromosome. He can have an A on this one or a T on that one, or an A and an A, or a T and a T. But if God put into genetic vari variation into Adam, a, T, G, C, C, T. That's 50-50. The human population would have started off with all the genetic variation at 50-50. There's nothing there at 50. Very few letters are found in 50% of the population. This looks like an evolutionary population. It looks like something that evolved very slowly over a long period of time. And any new mutation that's here off to the right, that's something that appeared in one person and slowly spread throughout the population. Most of them are still here because they're new and they haven't spread yet. Eee. So what we did is we took a computer model that we've used for a long time in human history, and we modeled an evolutionary population over about a million years with their 10,000 individuals. And we got that blue line. Any new mutation started with one person and slowly some of those mutations spread out into the population and became more common. And actually this disappointed us a lot. We were like, oh no. It looks like chromosome 22 reflects evolutionary time. Until we said, now let's look at the biblical model. Let's start with not Adam being homozygous, that's ridiculous. Adam's got inbuilt creation genetic diversity that God put into Adam. Let's let that work over time. We're going to add Noah's flood, reduce the whole population after 1,600 years to six people, and let them expand again into the modern human population. We also said, okay, let's look at an evolutionary model where, because a lot of people think that, um, you know, humans evolved, and then God picked two people, called them Adam and Eve, gave them a spirit, and those are the first two people, first two human beings, first people with a soul, if you would. There's a lot of kind of hybrid views on Adam and Eve. That's one of them. And we said oh, also, let's, um, let's not just assume that Eve was a clone of Adam. Let's allow God to put into Adam and Eve's reproductive cells as much genetic diversity as he wants. So the amount of genetic diversity in the world today depends upon how many children they had, because each child could have been totally different. And let's let that work through the population over time. And we got these. In fact, the evolutionary model was a worse fit for the real data, the black line, than any of the creation viewpoints. Now, sadly, we couldn't separate the evolutionary Adam and Eve from the biblical Adam and Eve, but that's the way science works. At least we say the evolutionary model doesn't actually work very well, and the biblical model works great. Is that over your heads? All right, chew on that for a moment. Let's go, let's get a little more simple. One of my favorite pictures. On the right, George Snow Wilson. <laughs> what a funny name. On the left, Bill Kubera. He is an Australian Aboriginal. They served together in Vietnam. They became best friends. In his old age, George got kidney disease. And they couldn't find a match. So his best friend said, hey, test me. Turns out he was a perfect match. And that white guy now has an after, well, he, I think they're both now dead, but one guy gave a kidney to the other guy. They don't just match blood type, 
there's about 100 genetic markers that, that, peop that doctors look at to make sure there's not gonna be a tissue rejection. How could it be that these two men who have no shared history going back thousands of years can be a genetic match for one another? What is a race? Genetically, we can't define it. There's a couple of letters that affects our skin color. whoop de do. Everything underneath that is telling us there's only one humanity. You okay with that? So let's ask this question. We gotta get people like that from Adam and Eve. What would they have had to look like? Well, if you mix all the people in the world together, you don't get that. You don't get that. These two beautiful people are at the opposite color spectrum ends of humanity. That woman, now she does produce some pheomelanin, which is the reddish pigment. She doesn't produce hardly any eumelanin. That boy produces as much eumelanin as the human body can produce. What would Adam and Eve have looked like? How do we get these color differences over just a couple thousand years? I'm gonna show you a map. This makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, this is something, it's just data, so the data should be okay. The problem is it was collected before World War II and essentially all the anthropologists before World War II uh, were raving racists. This field was driven by European racists who thought that they were intellectually, morally, and physically superior to all the other races of the world. And it's just a sad legacy of our history. I'm glad that baggage is finally being jettisoned by modern society, but it's, it's there. And what they did was, they took this card on the bottom left there, and they looked at people's armpits. <laughs> now the reason, because that, that area never sees any sunlight. That's your true skin color. And by taking that card around people in the world, they mapped human skin colors. And that's fascinating. But now modern genetics comes in here. And we've learned, let me turn my laser pointer here. We've learned that the people that live in southern India have the exact same genetic variants as the Central Africans. The trait didn't evolve twice. The people in island Melanesia and the Australian Aboriginals, they have the same exact genetic variants that cause dark skin color. In other words, that skin color was in the world before we spread out. Have you ever heard that dark skin is adaptive? That in the tropical regions, people get dark skin because it helps them survive? You heard that, right? Now, that's nonsense because um, skin cancer doesn't kill you until after you've had children. It doesn't kill you when you're in teens, it kills you when you're 50 or 60. It's irrelevant. Not only that, uh, what about out here? Where are all the dark-skinned people in the islands? Or how about, I mean, if you go to Ecuador? I mean, Quito is 1.6 miles in altitude. Do you know how much ultraviolet light people in Quito get? How much natural selection would have had in that population? Where's the dark skin? No, this is simply people moving. And I say this also, we don't have a lot of ancient DNA from Central Africa. Most of the ancient DNA we have is from Europe and Siberia because cold places preserve DNA, warm places don't. But we do have a few from Central Africa and even a thousand years ago, the people that lived in the middle of Africa didn't have dark skin. They had the skin color of the Khoisan Bushmen who live out in the Kalahari. You ever see the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy? Those, those, the short little, they're kind of tan people. They have, basically have the same skin color as Barack Obama and his mother was white. He's not, he's not a dark African man. He's not even really African, you know, whatever. He grew up as an African American, so I can take that he's part of that culture, but genetically he's half European. And, but the people that live here, they have the same color variance as the people in the Middle East. And the people that lived here 1,500 years ago had those same color variants. In other words, if you went to Africa 2,000 years ago, at the time of Christ, there wouldn't have been that many dark-skinned people. This is an effect of what's called the Bantu expansion. You've heard of the Zulus, right? The Zulus live right here in southern uh, South Africa. 
when the Dutch got to South Africa, they found a 100-mile-wide swath of open land that nobody lived in. And you know what they said? Woohoo, free land! No, the Zulus had killed everyone off within 100 miles of their homeland. <laughs> and the Dutch walked into a bloodbath, and then the English inherited that. That was the forefront of this expansion. You see, someone had invented a high technology. It's called the cow. Cows are amazing technology because your food comes with you. They can turn grass into steak. And that's the most amazing thing on earth. The herdsmen, they were also farmers, they had a lot of children because they had a lot of food and they expanded. And that was the Bantu expansion. By the way, uh, the earliest European DNA that we find, they had dark skin. Almost all of them had dark skin and blue eyes. Very strange. Light skin, we actually know where it came from. It came from Turkey. Anatolia, they came up the Rhine, they came around this way, and they wiped out all the original people. They married them also because their genes are still there, but that, that phenotype of the dark skin and blue eyes is absent from Europe. But those aren't even the Europeans. Now, the Europeans were living out here in the steppes of Asia. If you look in, in Europe in the ancient DNA, you will look in vain for someone who looks like a European genetically. Now, the Europeans were living out here, and they pushed westward and displaced all these people and took over a continent. But that's my other, my other talk on ancient DNA. Sorry, I just got distracted. Okay, so the answer to what would Adam and Eve have looked like? I say that if you had to have all the races in one people, they would have middle tones. It would be brown skin, brown haired, and brown eyed, like most Puerto Ricans are. Interestingly, you go to Puerto Rico and you start looking at the genetics of people, they're one of the most mixed groups of people in the world because a bunch of Europeans came over, mainly men. They brought over a bunch of Africans and it's the one large island in the Caribbean where the Spanish didn't kill off all the natives. And those three groups from three different places in the world mixed. And you've got people that look very well tanned. You start off with that mixture and you spread people out on the earth after the Tower of Babel, you can get races to start to develop from a mixed group. You don't need evolution. Now, where do races come from? They come from inbreeding. The reason that there are racially, if I can even use that word, uh, significant traits that we find across the world is that people haven't mixed across the world freely. Let me give you an example from the Bible. This is going to be kind of gross. Looking at on the bottom on the right there, those are the 12 tribes of Israel. On the top, that's Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Abraham's wife. Ugh. Different mothers, same father. He married his half-sister. They have Isaac. Now, Isaac is equivalent to their own brother because of that inbreeding from a half-brother and half-sister marrying. Isaac marries Rebekah. Well, if you look at the family tree, he is his first cousin once removed and first cousin twice removed times two because she's related to both of his parents. They have Jacob. Jacob marries his first cousin Rachel and his first cousin Leah who are much closer than first cousins because of all these intermarryings over time. But you know how um, you're half of each of your parents? You know that, right? You get half the DNA from mom and half from dad. That means you're 25% of your grandparents, 12 and a half of your great-grandparents, about six of your great-great-grandparents, three. By the time you get that many generations down, if you take the longest route, the 12 sons of Jacob should have been about one and a half, maybe 3% of Terah. But because they inherited D his DNA in multiple lines, they're about 22% of Terra. And about half of that, all the brothers have two identical copies. So if there was a gene in that family for height or weight or hair color or curliness of the hair or the shape of the nose, pick something. There's a high likelihood that all 12 brothers have exactly one copy of that trait on both
proud. In history, marriage someone born less than five miles away from where they were born. We did not have freely exchanging genes until the modern era. And there are significant places in the world, like you look at ancient Egyptian mummies, they don't have African DNA until after the Muslim conquests. Islam made a cultural milieu where the Africans from South to Sahara Desert can now mix with European type peoples. Oh, very interesting. But when you have isolated people groups and the Tower of Babel event is the recipe, we had a mixing population between the flood and the Tower of Babel, and then God dispersed these people across the planet in small people groups isolated from one another. That's where your races came from. It wasn't evolution. It wasn't deep time. It was just everybody marrying their cousin. You okay with that? If you don't think you're inbred, you're kidding yourself. <laughs> and I see pictures like this. This is the uh, evolutionary out of Africa story. They say we started, you know, they had this, I love it, way down here in Southern Africa. They don't think that. They think we evolved in Northeast Africa. But they put that down here, the origin, because Northeast Africa is right next to the Middle East. <clears throat> it's a little uncomfortable. So what they say is this. We evolved in Africa 100,000 years or so ago. That's when Homo sapiens first appeared. And then we left Africa. Follow me here. In small people groups with very limited mitochondrial diversity and Y chromosome diversity, moving into uninhabited territory through the Middle East in the recent past. Every single one of those points is something we would directly predict from the Tower of Babel account itself. Oh. Now, why is the, the origin in Africa? Africa does have more genetic diversity than the rest of the world put together. That is true. There are multiple reasons why that could be true. More people could have gone to Africa after Babel, or there's something different about their genetics where they have a higher mutation rate, which I don't think, or more recombination rate, which, which is actually there's evidence for that. There's all sorts of things that you can apply to this, but this basic picture is the Tower of Babel. And they say out of Africa instead. How about this? That's what the Bible says. The fact that there's a similar pattern in genetics is amazing and encouraging. And now it's up to those creation scientists and geneticists and historians and archaeologists to try to figure out this Africa story. It's not easy to just dismiss Africa, but I really don't think it's true for lots of other reasons. I'm kind of getting off the subject here. Let me get back to, uh, to my plan here. The Bible claims that there is one single man who's the ancestor of all people. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. You've read that before, right? You know that says that evolution is not true? The Bible says there is no common ancestry between man and any other species. And it starts right there. Oh. But then God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh, and the rib the Lord God taken from the man, he made into a woman. You've read that before, right? All right, so how many people did the human race start with? Trick question. One. Now, Eve was taken from Adam, which, you know, his flesh, his DNA, but she's a woman. He's, she's not a, a man. How do you get a woman from a man? All God's got to do is remove the Y chromosome and double the X chromosome. There's Eve. Or he could have given her a totally different genome. I don't know. I wasn't there. The point is, it's not really that big a challenge. And interestingly, the rib is the one bone in the body that will regrow if you leave the mesentery around it when you take the rib out. Facial surgeons know this. In fact, uh, Dr. Carl Whelan, who started CMI 45 years ago, he was moving from Perth, Australia on the West Coast to Brisbane, Australia on the East Coast. And he had, it was two family cars, and he was in one car, and he fell asleep driving across the outback in the absolute middle of nowhere. And it just so happened that what they call a road train, 
You, you know those doobies that we have here? <laughs> That's nothing compared to the, what they do in Australia. Because no one lives in the middle. They just rack up a bunch of things and they just drive. And they fell asleep and crossed the paint. He had no face. One, one of his legs is shorter than the other still. He has, he's blind in one eye. He's got a fake eye. But he, the man had no face. His face hit a semi-truck coming the other direction. And he's a doctor. He's a medical doctor. And after he's, he's being wheeled into the, the operating room for like the fourth time, knowing that they're going to take some rib bone, and he, and he joked to the doctor, oh, there must not be much of that rib left. And he goes, don't you know we take the whole thing out every time? Anyway. There's an interesting question also that we see a lot. And that is, what about the people outside the garden? Have you heard there's people outside the garden? I mean, who did Cain marry? Who was Cain afraid of that was going to kill him after he murdered Abel? Whoever finds me will kill me. You ever think about this? Who are these people? Well, I answered this in an article, How Old Was Cain When He Killed Abel? Because interestingly, in the Bible, we have the creation of Adam and Eve. The next time statement in the Bible is Adam is 130 years old when Seth is born. There's a 130-year window for Cain to kill Abel. I don't know when it happened. But the next child, I don't think Seth is the third child born. That would be ridiculous. That means hey, uh, Eve's only having children every 43 years. That's crazy. Seth is the next child born, and she names him replacement. Oh, that's cool. Cain and Abel could have been great-great-grandfathers by this point in time. There could have been a lot of people in the world by this point in time. Or Cain, being the son of Adam, was really smart. And he knew that eventually there's going to be a lot of people in the world. Either way works. But I don't think we have to appeal to other people. These are the descendants of Adam and Eve. Uh, Dr. Joshua Swamadas, um, evolutionary Christian, uh, he has this... Um, uh, website and group called Peaceful Science, which um, it's really difficult when the Peaceful Science crowds are insulting me constantly because you can't reply harshly because then you're not being peaceful and you look like a jerk. <clears throat> so he wrote this book called The Genealogical Adam and Eve? Question mark. This is probably the harshest review I've ever put in print. His science is atrocious and his Bible is terrible his understanding of the Bible, and I just put it in print, and it's out there for you to read. Um, he has this idea that evolution happened, and then God picked, either recreated Adam and Eve from scratch, or just picked two people from the world. Either way, there's no genetic difference. Adam and Eve put them in the garden, they fall, they leave the garden, and then intermarry with all the other people in the world, and their genetics just kind of blends into everybody else. And eventually, everyone is a genealogical descendant of Adam and Eve at least by the time of Christ. Therefore, we all died in Christ, you see, because we're all descended from Adam, you see. I think he's really grasping at straws. You can read that article for yourself. All right. Oh, I'm about halfway done. There's too much. I'm going to have to skip a little bit here. What am I going to skip? Yeah, I'll skip that. Here we go. Have you ever read the Table of Nations, Genesis chapter 10, that describes the people spreading out on earth after the flood? Have you ever heard that there's three main races, the Negroid, the Caucasian, and the Mongoloid? Have you heard that? Right. That is horribly racist, and it's not true. That is something that was given to us starting in the 1800s and all throughout the 1900s, which was abominably incorrect and totally non-biblical. But those phrases, those words still stick in our heads. And if you look at Scripture, there's three sons of Noah. And it looks like Shem went to Asia, Ham went to Africa, and Japheth went to Europe. Isn't that the source of the three races, the three human races? No. But if you just take the 10,000 foot view and you actually don't look at the details, you might think this is true. The big problem with this is that Shem, Ham, and Japheth's children would have married their cousins. Not necessarily only their brothers and sisters. They would have been intermingling in this family. The races, this distribution here, didn't start 
until the Tower of Babel five generations later. So Ham is the ancestor of everyone on earth today, as well as Japheth, as well as Shem. Okay? Colossians, Colossians 3, that's not right. Sorry, I forgot to change the verse. I stole the slide and just changed this. This is from Genesis. When Noah, um, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, right? Noah got drunk and Can Canaan laughed at him. Noah said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants she shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be a servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be a servant. He's cursing Canaan, and that's why black people have dark skin. Have you ever heard that before? This is a very, very common theme in Christian theology, and it's heretical. And it's awful, and it's not biblical. But when the Europeans, who eventually controlled the world at one point, now they're losing control now, but at one point in control at a time, the Europeans controlled the world. And when they started spreading out and looking at other people, they had some problems because they thought Adam and Eve were true. Where did Chinese people come from? Where did black people come from? What is this Native Americans? What is this? These people weren't supposed to exist because they were only thinking European. And so all these ideas came up. Monogenesis, we all came from Adam and Eve. Polygenesis, God created different groups of people. Polygenesis led to Darwinian views that the Europeans are highly evolved than the others. Is it true that black people have dark skin because God cursed Canaan? That makes no sense because Canaan didn't live in Africa. Oh yeah, Canaan, that's the promised land. That's Israel. Oh, this is totally nonsensical when you approach this from a racist perspective. It's not true. Okay. Here's a map of where the Bible says the great the grandchildren, great-grandchildren of Noah went. And if you look at the colors here, green is Ham. Oh, green is up here. Red is Japheth. Oh, yeah. Red's up here, too. Blue is Shem. Oh, yeah. Blue's up here, too. All three of these descendants of all three son, uh, brothers are all living on top of each other. And interestingly, the people that invented farming in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, they're the people that migrated up into Europe and became the European seed stock. And you can't look at a person and say, oh yeah, you came from Noah, I'm sorry, you came from Shem, because you can't look at a person's Y chromosome. The Y chromosome doesn't affect the, our coloration and things like that. People would merge and then spread out. And then after that, inbreeding in each little population should lead to some racial dis distinctions. But do, we, do you understand that we're all blended together? You got that? Okay. And then we have things like this. My Irish great, 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 something like that, uh, William Thomas Carter, moved from Ireland in 1845 the height of the Irish potato famine. Went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I am the result. My Y chromosome, because I've had my Y chromosome looked at, is held in common with about 80% of Western European men, and it's the highest concentration on the ed northwest edge in Ireland. So I've got a Y chromosome I share with like three million other Irish men. Not every Irish man, there's some others from totally different branches of the family that also live in Ireland. But my Y chromosome also appears in Cameroon. Amongst some of the darkest skinned people on the planet. Let me show you something I skipped over. This is me and the men from Cameroon. We're all closely related on the family tree. Other Irish men belong to groups I and J. They're very far away on the family tree. I am more closely related to men with the darkest skin on the planet than possibly to my Irish great-great-great-great-grandfather's next door neighbor. What is a race? 
I cannot define it. As a geneticist, I cannot define that word. Wow, that's cool. So the Bible claims one male ancestor, one female ancestor. That is not a requirement of evolutionary theory. It happens to be true. The Bible directly contradicts the idea that we have a common ancestor with chimpanzees. Why chromosome Adam and mitochondrial leave also contradict that because there's no evidence that any other Y chromosomes or any other mitochondria ever existed. They're not there. They're not found amongst us. It was possible if we came from a common ancestral population with chimpanzees that had some Y chromosome diversity. After we split, it was possible that some men could be more closely related to a chimpanzee than they are to other men. That's this argument. But that's not true. There is no chimpanzee-like Y chromosome in the human population. There's no human-like Y chromosome in the chimpanzee population. Our Y chromosomes are radically different. Our mitochondria are radically different. There's no evidence we came from a common source population. And now we can do things like bring in Neanderthal man. When I say Neanderthal, what do you think? He's a brute, right? He's stupid, right? He's got a hold of a big club, he's grabbing his woman by the hair, right? I mean, <laughs> these, these ridiculous things that we've been given through history, but that charcoal picture on the top there, that's from the 1800s. They made his muscles stick out more to make him look more like a monkey. The guy on the left there, that was in the New York Museum of Natural History. Why are both of his knees bent? They're trying to paper over the fact that from hips down, he looks just like you. Chimpanzees and humans have completely different hip structures, different knees, different lengths of tibias and tibias and things like that. We're different. Neanderthal men look like us. Now, they are a little different. They, their ribs tend to flare out. It's called a, a, a bell-shaped rib cage. We have a barrel-shaped rib cage. They're, they didn't have a chin. Modern Europeans tend to have a pronounced chin, some of us. Um, not even me so much, but they didn't have a chin, and their forehead sloped back. But look at the two skulls there. The Neanderthal brain was bigger than the modern man on average. What? I thought they were stupid. No. But think about this. They lived in Eurasia during the Ice Age, which is after the flood. They lived in the most marginal environment that humans could live in, and they survived. Stupid people don't survive in that sort of an environment. They had to work with the environment or it would have killed them. They painted in caves. They made musical instruments. They, they lived in caves, sure, because the cave's a great environment to live in when it's freezing cold outside. They partitioned their caves with, with separators to keep the heat and the families differently. And, and all these things, they, um, they, we know they had medicinal plants. When they, we know they, they searched for a particular species of birch which has aspirin in its bark and chewed on it. We can tell from the dental calculus and look at it genetically what's stuck in there between their teeth, yuck. You can do that and you can see what they ate. They ate mushrooms, they ate a wide diversity of plants. They had ships. They got to islands in the Mediterranean that were never exposed to dry land, even at the, the lowest water levels. They had to sail there. Homo erectus, made it to Indonesia, made it to the Philippines. That's open ocean travel. Homo erectus, yeah, they're human also. Modern depictions of Neanderthal. I mean, does that look like a half monkey to you? It's like a little boy. Why does this individual have green eyes and green hair and freckles and light hair? Because now we pull DNA out of Neanderthals and we realize they carried those traits. And some of their traits are in humans today. What? Yeah, they're our ancestors. They lived in Eurasia first. And as the ice melted back, the farmers started moving in. And they probably killed off most of the Neanderthals, but not all of them, because when two cultures hit each other in his history, they murdered each other. That's human history. But it's also always a Romeo and Juliet. It always happens. And people, when they meet each other, they blend. So my DNA, I'm 3% Neanderthal. That doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that three of every 100 of my ancestors was Neanderthal. 
in a lot of Neanderthal DNA. In fact, 60% of the Neanderthal genome is sitting in this room. And everyone's got different bits and pieces of it. They're our cousins. Well, we consider the words of Charles Darwin. This is from a book, uh, The Descent of Man. He did not dare write this in The Origin of Species, but 16 years later, he writes, or 21 years later, 12 years later, whatever. At some future period, not distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races, he meant Europeans, races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Oh, you can follow me here. At that same time, the anthropological apes will no doubt be exterminated. That's the, the baboon, no, sorry, that's the, uh, the chimpanzees, the orangutans, and the gorillas. He says, the break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider for intervening between man in a more civilized state and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between a Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Does that curdle your stomach? That is horrible. And yet, this is the father of evolutionary theory. Now, evolutionists today, that doesn't, it, I'm not saying they are racist. They're not. But they have a lot of baggage, a lot of ugly baggage. Luis Quintana Murci, a famous geneticist, the genes that explain, oh, big word here, phenotypic. That's the way you look. The genes that explain the differences in the way people look between populations only represent a tiny part of our genome, confirming once again the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. So science has finally caught up with the Bible. Colossians 3.1, here in the church, there is not Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. In Christ there are no racial divisions. Isaiah 59, 20, a redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the, the Lord. That word redeemer, same word used in the book of Ruth about Boaz. The kinsman redeemer. If you owe a debt, now Naomi had sold her land and went over to Moab. And when she came back, she's like, I want my land back, but I got no money. So her kinsman, Boaz, stepped in and bought the land in her name. And he got Ruth in the deal. That's pretty good for him, right? But my point is this. In Old Testament law, a relative could step in and take the debt that you owed. Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. But I'm not Jewish. How can Jesus take my debt? Well, he's related to me through Adam. Thus it is written, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Hallelujah. I am so happy that salvation doesn't come from Jacob through Israel. But it comes through Adam, the first human ever. Sorry, the second Adam, Jesus, who is the model of the first human Adam. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off and were brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh a dividing wall of hostility. Specifically talking about the dividing wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. But consider this. My pagan, Viking, and Celtic ancestors knew nothing about the events of the Bible. I read the history of my own people, and I'm disgusted. They were terrible. They were as wicked as you could be. They were murderous. They were idolatrous. They, they were just gross people. And yet, Jesus sought me out when I'm not related to anything in the Bible? Yeah, because of Jesus, the last Adam, stepping into the place and fixing the problem set up by the first Adam. And if we are all descended from Adam, and Adam solely and exclusively, the biblical story makes sense. So when I'm talking to someone about race and racism, I'm not talking about Black Lives Matter. I'm not trying to argue you're a Marxist. That doesn't go anywhere. It might be true, but it doesn't go anywhere. Cut all that out and say, you know what? We're in the same boat. We're all descended from Adam. We're all wicked sinners. None of us deserve the attention of God. But God saved me anyway. And brother, sister, he can save you too. 
we are equal in the eyes of God. Period. There's a lot of other information. Look at creation.com. Look at our creation magazine. I brought a bunch of books and um, uh, DVDs out there. Our, our website's got, I think, 15,000 articles now. There's so much more. We have an entire race and racism Q&A section. Just type in races and one, you know, a couple articles and be Q&A. Click on that and it'll just list all the articles we have on the subject. We have been writing about this for a long time. We have not had to change what we've written. In fact, the science has only more and more confirmed what we started writing decades ago. It's very exciting. In each one of my talks this morning, I'm going to leave you with 1 Peter 3.15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Can we do that? I think so, if we know our stuff. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for a Sunday morning. Thank you so much you gave us the freedom to be able to come here and just learn about you. Thank you for the Bible. Without that record, we would not have answers to hardly anything. You told us where we came from. You told us our, our sinful position now. And you told us the antidote for the curse of death. And that is the blood of Christ. Help us, Lord, to hold on to Jesus with everything we have. Help us to love the people in our lives that we meet, even the ones that don't like us back. And help us to love them enough that we point them towards Jesus, the answer to wickedness, rebellion, sin, angst, anger, racism, all that baggage that all of us carry. Help us, Lord, to see through the problems in our society and see that there's a gospel answer to the horrible questions that we're struggling with. Amen. Let's give Dr. Carter a hand. Thank you, Dr. Carter, for that. It was excellent. Never thought you would call everybody a Neanderthal, but it worked. That was really good. Thank you for that. Now, um, so we have 20 minutes bef between now and the uh, next session. The next session is on Christian worldviews. So I'd encourage you to go get some breakfast in the back and uh, look at the table and, um, and uh, purchase those books. Jay is back there, and she'll be there to check you out. And uh, we'll meet back here at 11 o'clock. You're dismissed.
Just a reminder, we'll have overflow in the fellowship hall, so if we run out of space here, you can sit in the back and watch the live stream of the service. Just a reminder, we have overflow available in the back in the fellowship hall. You can watch the service live there. Squeeze in. I'll let you know if the person next to you bites. You can squeeze in next to them. It's all right. Good morning. Good to see you all here as you're finding your seat. I do want to remind you that we do have uh, live streaming in the fellowship hall. So if you need to sit back there, you can do that. And if you just like to spread out, you can also go to the courtyard and listen to the audio. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it's out there if you want to. Thank you for joining us this morning. How many of you were here last week, last Sunday? Did you have fun? 
Man, it was, a, it was one of the most exciting Sundays I think I've ever had where we celebrated the resurrection of, of the Lord Jesus Christ with not just our church, but with 1,500 other people. We had nearly 1,000 young people, kids, on our campus last Sunday, and I hope they had a good time. Did you enjoy seeing the uh, helicopter dropping the eggs? Yes. Um, I just want to thank all of our volunteers. You did such an amazing job um, coordinating the uh, people coming on campus, over 500 cars, and the people leaving campus, and all the work that went into planning it all out. The Lord was glorified. People's lives were changed. People's hearts were touched, and I'm thankful for that. In fact, if you're here today and you're um, a result of what happened last Sunday, thank you for joining us again. Today we have another very special service. It's not going to be me preaching this Sunday because we have Dr. – did somebody go woohoo? I heard that. It was over here. Missy? I heard it. We have uh, – <laughs> We have Dr. Rick Carter, who is a uh, scientist from Creation Ministries International. He'll be speaking this morning on, um, on, having, on developing and understanding a Christian worldview that takes into account creation versus evolution. This morning at 9.30, we had another session, and it was all about uh, races as it relates to, um, to the Bible. And it was incredibly enlightening, really interesting. A lot of things that he mentioned at the 9.30 uh, service were um, were things that I've heard in churches and things I've heard in on the uh, on you know the History Channel that he uh, combated and I appreciate his ministry not just to uh, uh, the intellectual side of it but to churches like ours. So he's going to be speaking. It's going to go from about uh, eleven o'clock to twelve o'clock and then tonight at five o'clock it's going to be a really really special service. Make sure your kids are here because he's going to be talking about dinosaurs and how can you not like to talk about dinosaurs. It'll be great Q&A with the kids, and it's interactive. So make sure to bring your kids, and make sure you come tonight at 5 o'clock. But let's go ahead and stand. Ryan's going to open us up in music, and then Dr. Carter will come up after that. But let's start with prayer. Dear God, uh, first, um, every word of your word is true. And as Bible believers, Lord, we rest our eternity on the infallibility of the word of God. And here today, Lord, I thank you that we're able to uh, hear Dr. Carter uh, speak on, uh, 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 on this subject of creationism and uh, having a creationist worldview. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to, to, you'll give us some arrows in our quiver, Lord, that we're able to use when we're combating and, and hearing uh, misinformation that is out there, Lord. And even for ourselves, we're swimming in an alternate worldview, Lord. I pray that you just encourage us here today to develop um, some good counterpoints and understand things from a biblical perspective. I think, Lord, most importantly, I pray that we're not just being informed, but that we are listening so that we can go and tell others. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to have that kind of ear so that we can not just hear it, but also tell uh, tell our friends and family. And Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, it's pr- primary, it's important that they leave here knowing that you died for their sins, Lord. If there's someone here today and you're convicting them, you brought them to Calvary for that reason, I pray that today would be the day that they'd receive you as Savior. I pray they'd talk to me or, uh, or others, Lord, on how they can know for certain that they're on the way to heaven. Lord, bless the day. Bless everything that's going on in this hour. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, remain standing. Um, we're going to not have the words on the screen, but they're ones that you know. To God be the glory, we're going to sing together as we start services this morning. So remain standing and sing along with us. To God be the glory, great things He had done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. So praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. On that last verse, great things that He hath taught us, great things He hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus. Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be 
our wonder, our transport. When Jesus we on the chorus, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Sing this chorus with us, God is so good. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. Sing that one more time with us. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. You're singing great this morning. We got one more song. We're going to sing How Great Is Our God. When we come out of a service, an amazing service that we had last Sunday on uh, Resurrection Sunday, when we get to celebrate our Heavenly Father raising from the dead. And that's the reason why we're here this morning, is we can say how great and how good our God is. We saw some amazing things happen Sunday. We saw some amazing things happen this week. And we're excited about it, and we're thankful that you are here with us today. But sing with us how great is our God as we uh, continue this morning. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. And how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see. How great, how great is our God. You're singing great this morning. Continue singing. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands. Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. So then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, and then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Sing that chorus one more time with us. How great is our God. 
Sing with me how great is our God, and all will sing how great, how great is our God. Great singing this morning. You may be seated. Dr. Carter, if you will come, let's give uh, Dr. Carter a hand as he is on the way up, and uh, thank you so much for being with us today. second. Hey, I, I need to take a poll. How many of you were not here earlier? One, two, three, four. Oh, lots of people. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, I am going to do something now which is going to be very strange. This might be the weirdest sermon you've ever heard. And I must ask you the question, what did you come out to see? Oh, okay. <clears throat> what did you come out to see? A reed shaken by the wind? An idiot standing at a pulpit trying to explain God? What are you here for? I hope you're not here to hear me. I hope you're here to hear a message, perhaps spoken through me. My only goal here is to point to Christ. I am nothing. I am going to attempt to show you that you're nothing. And it's going to hurt. I'm doing it on purpose, though. Because we need to understand how this universe works. We need to understand God. We need to understand our position in this universe. But the reason I'm doing this is not to humiliate us. It's so that we can have a better understanding of things so we can talk to other people. Because the person who does not believe in God is generally very confident that God does not exist. And they often use science, which is very confident things, right? People who talk about science, they're so persuasive. But what if they actually don't know what they're doing? I'm going to give you three big ideas. First, I want to try to show you that science depends upon philosophy. That's surprising to many people, but it's true. I want to impress upon you that there are more things we don't know than we do know. And I want to try to tell you that it is reasonable to trust the Bible. Things we don't know. What is light? What's gravity? What are electrons? Those things rule our world. All of engineering, all this technology is based on these electromagnetism. What on earth is that? We have no idea. Is a photon a wave or a particle? Beats me. It's both, sorta, kinda, maybe. The most fundamental things about reality are mysterious. I wrote an article kind of off topic already um, called We Are Less Than Dust. One of my favorite things I've ever written. What I did was I, I compared an atom to a solar system. Let's take the nucleus of a hydrogen atom and make it as big as our sun. Where are the electrons? They'd be 13 times further away than Pluto. And electrons essentially have no size. In between is nothingness. And if you wanted a molecule, here's one nucleus, here's the next nucleus. You, you, if you had a, a, a nucleus as big as the sun, from the next nucleus, you couldn't even see the other nucleus. It would be so small. And in between is nothingness. You are actually empty space. You're 99.999999% nothing. The reason I can see you and you can see me is that these things are called photons, which we don't even know what these things are. They're reflecting a, 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 off an electromagnetic force field and going to your eyeballs. <laughs> First Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even also I am known. People who have gone on before us, they know both sides. We don't. We only know the physical world and little inklings of the spiritual world that God may have revealed to us here and there. You know when Jesus appeared to the apostles in the upper room through, in the locked door, past the locked door, 
Right? What do Christians say? Oh, he walked through the wall. The Bible doesn't say that. But what if he did walk through the wall? Was that because he's a ghost or because the wall is? Who's more real, Christ or us? I think Christ is. He's on the other side. He has a full comprehension of all of reality. We only have this and its emptiness. If you took away that electromagnetic force field, the earth would be invisible. There would be nothing there. There's no nuclei. They're so small. If you took the entire universe, all the hydrogen in the entire universe, and you brought it all together, it would be a ball of mass not many times larger than our solar system. If you strip away all the electrons, the nuclei will pack into a ball smaller than the orbit of Neptune. That's all the mass in the entire universe. There are giant unanswered questions. And the funny thing is, the secular world knows this. Therefore, we get to talk about things like this, and it's fun. New scientists, just a couple years ago, why do we exist? <laughs> Nobody knows. Why is there anything? Why is there matter? Why is there life? Why are there thoughts? Is the, why is the universe just right? Why is there good and evil? The secular world has no answers for these things. We do. One of the basic propositions of Christianity is that we have an all-powerful, genius creator God who is outside of the created universe. Therefore, he is sufficient to explain the universe because he made it. In the evolutionary, long-age, secular sort of view, what do they have? The universe just is. Why are there universal laws in the universe? They just are. No, my God, the ultimate lawgiver, naturally would have made a universe that operates according to law. If the universe was crazy and weird, that would reflect God's character. The universe runs like a clock, and it's predictable. That reflects God's character. If you're new to creation.com and CMI, and you want more information, maybe you're not interested in these topics, but some other topics, let me encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. It comes out once a week, something interesting. We might even interview a former evolutionist. Who knows what might happen? But we'll put together something the world's talking about, and we send it to all our people, and it's a great way to stay connected to these sorts of ideas. I have a volunteer that I literally just met. Um, I, hey, dude, can you help me? He's like, yeah, sure. So this guy's top fellow in my list. He's going to hand out this. If you want to get our newsletter, we ask for a name and email address and a zip code. Easy peasy. If you don't want it, no big deal. But when they're done, can you all pass them to the edges? Because he's going to collect them in a couple of minutes. All right, dude, thank you so much. Appreciate it. My new best friend. All right, while those are going around, let me ask you another question. What is evolution? What's the definition of evolution we hear all the time? Evolution is just... Yeah, but that's not true because I believe in change over time and I'm an evolutionist. The word evolution means unfolding. That's what the basic definition of the word means. So yeah, change over time, something's unfolding. Okay, fine. But that's not what the evolutionist means when they say the word. Because what if the change is backwards? What if it's downhill? What if it goes in a circle? That's not what they're talking about. No, if you want to define evolution, you have to use the phrase common ancestry. Sorry about the typo there. You have to use the phrase common ancestry. It's the belief that enough change over enough time can lead to the common ancestry of all things. We can't let them redefine that word because really they're using it in a way that I would never use it. But see, I'm a biologist. I study living things. That's what biology is, the study of living things. But I'm not an evolutionist. And the reason for that is I'm not a naturalist. What's that? What's naturalism? I can prove very easily that science is based on philosophy, by the way. My PhD, what does PhD stand for? Yeah, piled higher and deeper. No, no, no. <laughs> what does PhD stand for? A doctorate in philosophy? The PhD is philosophy. What philosophy are we talking about here? What is the philosophy that undergirded all of my scientific training? 
called naturalism. It's a belief. And ism is a belief, right? Naturalism is a belief that nature is all there is. Naturalism is a belief that natural processes can be used to explain everything that's ever happened in the entire history of the universe. Notice that cuts God out. God operates miraculously and by fiat, he doesn't operate through natural processes. He says, let it be, and it was so. He didn't say, allow millions of years of selection and mutation pressures to drive the origin of plants. No, he said, let the earth produce. Very different. So if you take the study of life, biology, and you apply the philosophy of naturalism, you will get evolution every time. Because there's no other answer. If you have nothing but nature to explain nature, it must take a very long time. Because you can't have a miracle in there. But if you take the study of biology and you apply a belief in God, theism, and different ways of doing I think it's biblical creationists, but I don't want to cut out other people who think they're biblical. I just don't think they are. But, you know, <laughs> I would be called a young earth creationist. And the reason I am perfectly comfortable with that is because my universe was created at some point in time. Now, doesn't the universe look very old? Is God a deceiver? No, God is definitely not a deceiver. So if the apparent age of the universe means the Bible's wrong, that's one thing. But if the apparent age of the universe means that we just got to rethink about the universe. If you think naturalistically, yeah, sure, it looks like it took billions of years to form. But what if it didn't? I mean, what, what prevented God from creating a star right on the verge of exploding just for the fun of it? What prevented God from creating a cloud of gas that's condensing in space? What created God from, you know, starting a star and exploding it right away? Woo, boom! What prevented God from making galaxies of all different types and sizes and scales and black holes and whatever? Nothing at all. If God had created a universe where galaxies were like as equally spaced as the, as the little squares on the carpet, that would be really boring and rather non-creative. Instead, there are giant swirls of galaxies, giant masses, just the universe is cool, fascinating, and created. I'll get back to that in a second. Now, I am a marine biologist by training. For those of you who weren't in the earlier uh, thing, let me just do this again. I spent a long time scuba diving for a living. Um, a couple hundred scuba dives at night because we're studying coral reproduction. They reproduce at night. Uh, a couple hundred scuba dives in the daytime. It, it, was, it was a nice life. <laughs> I ended up in the genetics lab studying these beautiful corals. And when I stole the genes from these guys and engineered them to those fish, that's when I got my doctorate. Now that's, again, as I said earlier, a totally different subject genetic engineering, and the moral peril that humanity now is directly standing in front of is something that we need to deal with in our society, and I don't think we're mature enough to deal with it. And great evil is going to happen because of the technologies that we've invented. But great good is also going to happen because we're going to be able to fix a lot of things, genetic problems. The problem is how many of us, when we go to the doctor and says, oh, I'll just give you one injection, that'll be fixed, how many of us will think, to ask the doctor how many babies had to be aborted in order to generate that knowledge. Another subject for another day. What I want to do is I want to start with this idea of protein production. I stole a gene from corals and put them into fish, and the fish started making a protein. What is that? How is the process made? Let me turn off my sound on my computer. Ooh, turn off the sound. There we go. That is a nucleotide, one of the four letters in your DNA, four different chemicals. There's your DNA. It's a famous double helix. There's four letters, A, C, G, and T, and they mutually bond to each other across these two different things. Oh, that red thing that you zip by, that is called, sorry, that, that's called a polymerase. Sorry, there's two different things I got a name here. And we're way oversimplifying this. Your genes are not like this. Your genes. When, when you're making what's called a messenger RNA, that red thing, notice it's only copying one side of one of the, the two strands. You have to splice and dice little pieces to make your final protein. But let's just think of a nice simple one. Ooh, 
Now we have a messenger RNA. We're going to take that and turn it into a protein. And we use these little things called transfer RNAs. At the bottom, there's a three-letter code that matches the three-letter codes in the RNA. At the top, there's something called an amino acid, which is part of a protein. That is a ribosome. It's a machine operating in your body right now. You have gazillions of them. And notice it's matching up three letters of the transfer RNA, and then at the top, the amino acids are popping off and forming a growing protein strand. But most proteins, if left to themselves, are going to fold into a random ball. They need help being folded. So there's other proteins called chaperones that glom onto that strand, and they don't let it fold. And they bring it over to another giant molecule. We don't know how this thing works yet. By the way, every step I'm showing you is multiple doctoral dissertations and Nobel Prizes. But this molecule is called a chaperonin. We know that the unfolded protein goes in one end, and then it closes up. Notice the different colors, there's, different, there's six different proteins there. Actually, it's 12. And it magically folds this protein. If it doesn't fold right, it'll chop it up. And out the other end spits a folded three-dimensional protein, which changes shape over time, making a four-dimensional structure. We just went through from a four-letter alphabet, A, C, G, and T. A, C, G, 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 T, C, 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 A, 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 C, 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 G, G, C. It's really boring. DNA is fantastically boring. But we went from that language with four letters to this language of 20 letters, 20 amino acids, actually it's 21 in the human body. But the chemistry of that protein has nothing to do with A, C's, G's, and T's. There's no relationship between the output and the input. We're talking about in life, there are different levels of abstraction, and we're translating from one language type to a completely different language type. Evolution has a very hard time answering this because there's no feedback. It's not like, oh, hey, change that A to a C, and now the protein works. It's not the way it works. You're just making a bunch of proteins. The proteins have nothing to do with the letters themselves. It's a one-way system. How do we get life off the ground here? This is a chicken and egg problem. That protein might be part of the ribosome. That protein might be part of the DNA polymerase. That protein might be part of a chaperone or chaperone in. And yet, you can't have that protein until the system is working. What came first? It's a chicken and egg problem, and it's a bad one. All the evolutionary origin of life stories have a massive chicken and egg problem. You can't get living things until you have living things. Granted, if life were really simple, evolution might be possible. Life is not simple. Psalm 92.4, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the work of your hands, I sing for joy. I love that verse, and as a biologist, I exult in God's creation. Science should be magisterial. We should be using science to praise God. For what has man done in his wickedness? He taken God's creation and used it to mock God but only through his ignorance. Because the more we learn about science, the more we realize humans are really dumb. I want to ask you a question. How do you know what you know? How do you know anything is true? How do you know you're awake right now? How do you know God didn't create the universe yesterday and fill your head with false memories? How do you know I'm not a robot? You can't know any of those things. And yet, if we use our brains, we have this thing called history, and we have memories, and everything in our brain is consistent with the idea that yesterday really did exist. There's no reason to think otherwise. Everything fits beautifully. Yeah, you can think of some otherworldly sort of, you know, sci-fi sort of scenario, fine. But there's no reason for that. So we use our God-given brains to approach reality. 
But as we're learning about reality, you know how hard school was. Remember cramming and cramming and cramming, and you take a test and you immediately forget everything you just, tr you just learned for five minutes? You remember that, right? There's so much information, it's hard to know. It's hard to deal with it. Hey, um, let me, I'm going to talk to the 18-year-olds in the room, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-olds. Adults, you've already been through this, so you just ignore me for a moment. Um, you're at the most dangerous part of your life right now. You have adult bodies. You have adult brains. You don't have adult experience. By the time you're done with college or high school, you will have the ability to parrot everything your professor or teacher said. Yep, you sure will. You can know anything that an adult knows. Right now, you're old enough to know anything. But you don't know anything. Because it'll take you another 20 or 30 years to figure out why your professor said it that way and not this way. They've got the experience. They've seen 100 carbon copies of you. You've only seen this the first time you ever go to college. You've never met a professor before. He has had practice in taking your brain and making a mirror image of his brain. And you will have never seen anything like it. 20, 30 years later, you'd be like, oh, well, that guy was dumb. But he sure seemed very impressive the first time you heard it. And now in the modern world, we have a massive problem with misinformation. You want to go into politics? You want to talk about Russia right now and the war on Ukraine? You want to talk about what you might read in National Geographic? How do we know what's true? And there's so many people. They'll just stand up there and they'll just talk like this and oh, blah, 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 blah. And they're so confident. And yet they're talking nonsense. And we can't know it because we don't have their knowledge. You're not an expert in all things. It's not possible to be an expert in all things, not even close. So we have authority figures talking to us. All I have to do is say COVID-19, and you know what I'm talking about. How are we supposed to judge what they're saying? How much do we trust them? Oh, man, this is really hard. And here's the worst part of it all. The Internet has destroyed us. When we go on Google and you Google something and your friend sitting right next to you Googles the same thing, you get different search results on purpose because Google already knows you. They've already got you categorized. They know what you like. They know, kind of know, they're trying to take a guess at what you're looking for. And if you're, you know, some soccer playing super macho guy, you're probably not looking for chocolate chip cookie recipes. I'm just saying, Google's making guesses about that. But Facebook, YouTube, Parler, MySpace, <laughs> you name any social media algorithm, they have pigeonholed you and they're spoon feeding you information that you like. If they gave you something you didn't like, you would leave and go to another service. So our modern world has partitioned us to the point where there's not a free exchange of ideas anymore. And people are in a little thought bubble. And it's true for everybody. And it's really hard. And you know what? I don't like being exposed to Marxists. I don't like being exposed to racists. I don't like being exposed to people who think differently than me. And therefore, I fall into that bubble also. And yet, how do we talk to people about Jesus if we're only talking to other people who already believe Jesus? And yet, if you get outside of your little bubble, you will be insulted, you will be belittled, you will be, you know, all caps yelled at. It will be embarrassing and difficult. So how do you know what you know? Ouch. And yet, there's this thing called science. And I need to define what science is before we go any further. The thing is, I can't. There's different types of science, and they're all science. So one type of science, we call it operational science. It deals with observing and repeating and testing experiments today, right now, right here. That has led to the development of all of our modern technology, including this nuclear-powered rover that NASA drives around Mars today. This is the type of science you started learning in eighth grade. It has nothing to do with evolution. It's just figuring out how things work. 
I am perfectly happy to be in this realm of science right here. So evolution only comes in when you try to explain where things came from. That's a different type of science called historical science. But history only happens once. It's not observable if you weren't there. It's not testable. It's not repeatable. History and operational science are different, but it's still science but it's much more philosophical based. I mean, we're not arguing over the, the speed of light, the boiling point of water, the force of gravity, the, the, the charge on an electron. We're arguing over, did stumpy, some stumpy-legged fish crawl out of a sea 500 million years ago and its way to evolve into dinosaurs and people? That's a historical question. Can you see the difference between the two? Engineering, physical science, stuff happening today is different than reaching back in the past and trying to explain other things. In fact, modern science, specifically operational science, was laid down by Christians. Men like Johann Kepler, the great astronomer who discovered the three laws of planetary motion that NASA used to fly things around a solar system. He says his work was like thinking God's thoughts after him. I said a little while ago that science should be magisterial. Yeah. We are, I mean, there, there have been times in my scientific career where I worked like a dog and I finally got a graph on a screen. And I'm looking at this relationship and I said, whoa, wait a minute. No one's ever seen this before. God revealed it through me. You know how humbling that is? You know how amazing that is? Science should do nothing but praise God. Kepler certainly did. In fact, you ever struggle in science class? Remember those horrible formulas? Ugh. You know, a lot of those formulas have Greek letters in them, right? Skip the Greek letters. There's also a lot of Latin letters. That's almost always the initials of a Christian's name. Because Christian philosophy laid down the groundwork for modern science. It did not come from Greece. Why? Because if there's a Zeus standing on top of a mountain and he's got a lightning bolt in his hand and he doesn't like you, he's going to send a lightning bolt down and kill your lab rats. <laughs> if there are fairies out in the garden, you can't leave your test tubes overnight and not think that maybe the fairies snuck through the window and rearranged your test tubes. No. Science works in a created universe created by a beneficent, loving, constant God. It doesn't work in fickleness. And that's why science was still born until the Christian Revolution and then it went on hyperdrive in the Protestant Revolution. So even though science was formulated by early Christian thought, Middle Ages Christian thought, really, what happened? It wasn't the scientists, it was the philosophers. They took this idea that the universe operates according to law and they got rid of the lawgiver. They said, it just is. I think, therefore, I am. <laughs> no, you think because God created you. The universe operates like it does because the very power of God is infusing the universe. One day, it's going to be rolled up like a scroll displaying the ultimate power of God over the physical universe. And then he's going to recreate it. And those who are in Christ are going to live for eternity on a recreated earth, not heaven with wings floating on clouds. No, physical bodies, recreated earth with Jesus. Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand the universe is created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now, in context, there's different ways of interpreting this verse, but this almost sounds like he's saying naturalism is not true. What you're witnessing was not self-created by processes and things that are already in existence. No, the universe was created by the word of God out of nothing. But in the end, the universe does run like a clock. So it is true, the universe was created. It's also true, the universe is naturalistic. We can approach the universe as if miracles are not happening. Miracles are rare. 
That's why science works. But we have this issue, and that is nature. That's a Roman goddess. <clears throat> we just don't have another word in English to say, things happen all by themselves according to the basic laws of thermodynamics and statistical probability. Who wants to say that? We just say it's natural. And so there is an issue that our pagan baggage has bled over into the English language. I don't know any other way to say it. I'm not invoking the goddess nature when I say things are natural. And yet, even if the universe is naturalistic, naturalism is a terrible explanation of origins. Think of that again. Naturalism is a terrible explanation of origins. Just because something works that way now, that doesn't explain where it came from. Let me say it this way. I don't necessarily know what, nat what the natural world really is like, right? I've only got a vague understanding of it, just like all of us. But let's just imagine that reality is these vertical red bars. And science, our way of approaching the world, is kind of like an interpretive filter. Can you see that off on the left here? If you're thinking wrong about how nature works, you still might get some things right. Right? That's evolution. Evolution absolutely gets some things right. It makes predictions, and those predictions are true. There's no doubt about that. But it doesn't mean it's right in the end. It just means it gets some things right. Now, I'm not claiming I have a perfect understanding of reality, but can you see that the more you align your way of thinking with reality, the more you should understand? Science should be trying to correct bad thoughts. But by getting rid of God, that's the ultimate bad thought. And they ran with that now for several centuries. And they had a good run of it in the 1800s and 1900s. But now, with all of our technology, we're understanding the intricacies of the cell. And as we dig and dig and dig, we see there's no end of complexity, which is the antithesis of naturalistic origin stories. They need it to be simple, and it's not. Okay. Got another question for you. What's natural selection? What is it? Is it magic? No. Nature's not thinking. Nature's not alive. It's not even survival of the fittest. See, Darwin knew natural selection was a pretty bad term. So one of his friends came up with survival of the fittest, which is also not a great term, because who's the most fit? Is it the biggest, the strongest, the smartest, the fastest, the one with the best eyesight? Who's the most fit? It's the one who has the most offspring. So it might be that you have like, like Germans, oh boy. They wasted themselves in two wars. And they said, oh, we're the most superior people in the world. Uh, you know what the highest death rate of all German units was the SS? Absolutely stupid. They're, we're macho men, ah, and they're all dead. The smartest, strongest, most athletic Germans died. The weenie men who were hiding in the back with the baggage, they got all the women after the war. Just saying. <laughs> what is the fittest? It's the person or the organism who has the most offspring. But I have no problem with that. I have no problem at all thinking that, you know, in a creation setting, here's a mountain. And on the bottom of the mountain, there's a swampy area, and the top of the mountain is very dry. And there's oak trees on this mountain. And in that popular oak trees are some genes that affect how much water the, the roots, uh, how much water on the roots the tree can tolerate. So some oak trees, they don't mind wet roots, and some oak trees really like dry roots. Guess what happens over many generations of oak trees? The ones down here are going to be producing a lot of acorns with the genes that tolerate wet roots. The ones up here are producing a lot of acorns with the genes that tolerate dry roots. And over time, because of natural selection, you're going to differentiation of this population. And, all, and a couple thousand years later, all the oak trees on the top of the hill are going to be different than all the oak trees at the bottom of the hill. Okay, whatever. 
That it should be called differential reproduction, but that's not also that's a what does that even mean? That's what it means what I just described, but the phrase is really hard. This is a very difficult concept only because the phrases are so difficult to understand. But my oak tree example, I think, is pretty simple. In fact, I wrote an article called Natural Selection in Paradise. And in fact, I'm giving that presentation at the Myrtle Beach Creation Conference in May. Um, the idea is even without sin, even without death of higher animals, you can still have natural selection on the earth. Because, you know, given millions of years, if Adam and Eve had never fallen, there's no death of humans or animals. There's still going to be death of E. coli. The Bible doesn't talk about bacteria. It's the nephesh creatures, the creatures that breathe. They're not dying. Anything lower than them is an open question. But, you know, there's a stream running down some mountain. It's carrying silt. Therefore, there's going to be a delta, and it's going to grow. There's a little pond with frogs in it. Well, over time, that pond is going to fill up with plant material, and the pond's going to dry out. The environment is still going to be changing even without death. Natural selection is not evolution. It fits perfectly well in with the biblical model. You all right with that? Let me give you another example. Here's some bacteria. There's a mutant bacteria and a normal bacteria. The mutant one has a small, pore, a small pore. So you see the antibiotic and purple can't get in, and some of the food doesn't get in, so it grows very slowly. But the one on the left, oh, the antibiotic goes right through that hole, and so does the food, and uh, wait a minute. So in the presence of an antibiotic, the mutant slow-growing cell lives. That's almost every case of antibiotic resistance we see in bacteria. The bacteria grow more slowly. Are they superior? No, they're mutant, they're degenerate. But they happen to live in that environment and therefore they survive to have more bacteria. Whatever. All right, no, another illustration, wait, 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 no, 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 no. Another illustration for you. I call this the two worlds fallacy. Many, many times I've heard a creation, uh, an evolutionist say, do you believe this? I say, yeah. They say, oh, then you believe in evolution. If I say natural selection is true. Oh, you believe in evolution. No, I don't. Change over time. Oh, you believe in evolution. No, I don't. You see, both of these ideas are trying to cover the same territory. It's not like we have two completely separate worlds, like the world of creation and the world of evolution. It's not like every time I find a bit of information that supports evolutionary theory, does that discredit creation? Every time I find something that supports the Bible, does that prove evolution is wrong? No, because of this. And the area of overlap cannot be used to make a decision whether one is true or not. Change over time, natural selection, all that kind of stuff, it fits in both worlds. And yet, here's the trick. Some high school biology textbook, there's Information, 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 information. All of that supports evolutionary theory. Therefore, evolution is true. And a student is saying, yep, sure looks like evolution is true. Because all that does fit evolution. The thing is, everything they said also fits creation. It's very, very difficult to find something that separates the two ideas. So we wrote a, um, a book and we have a documentary. It's called Evolution's Achilles Heels. What we did is we only interviewed PhD scientists who believe the Bible. I said, okay, you're a nerd. Hey, Mr. Nerd, tell us. In your area of expertise, what can evolution not answer? And man, they said the most incredible things. We call them evolution's Achilles heels. We spend a lot of time defending the Bible, defending creationism. We said, no, 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 let's make them defend their turf. So we put the ball on the one yard line said, we're going for a touchdown. Defend. And evolution's Achilles heels was the result. What we're trying to do is get outside of the area of overlap. Why argue over those things? They're true. Let's talk about things that either are true or not, and the trueness or notness will tell us if evolution is true or creation is true. So you've no doubt seen pictures like this, right? 
the famous experiment from the 1950s where they took simple gases, ammonia, methane, water, hydrogen. They ran it through water and they boiled the water. Then they ran it through a, an electric spark discharge, zap, 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 like to simulate lightning. Then they cooled it off and collected it on the bottom there. The, the Miller-Urey experiment and what they found was the building blocks of life. And that convinced so many people that evolution was true. I can't even I estimate how many. A huge number of people. That's all they needed. Oh, evolution must be true then. You see that? You can get life from nothing but simple chemicals. Is that true? Absolutely not. Yeah, you know what they showed? Random chemical reactions produce random chemicals. That's what they showed. Yeah, they did get a couple, maybe 20 or 30, or maybe 40, simple molecules that life needs. They didn't get any complex molecules that life needs. And what they didn't significantly get was pure molecules. We use 20, 21 amino acids. There are thousands of potential amino acids. All amino acids have a mirror image form. So like my left and my right hand aren't the same, but they're kind of the same, but they're not. They're mirror images. Molecules have mirror images also. We use all of this type and none of that type. There's no reason for that. Chemically, they're the same molecule, but God chose to use all these and none of those. And the sugars also are left and right-handed, and God used the other ones and not these. Weird. But not only that, even if you could get all those complex chemicals, Nothing in chemistry says we can, even if you could. I will give the evolution millions of years. I'll give them DNA. I'll give them proteins. I'll give them long chains of sugars. I'll give them cell uh, uh, membranes. I'll give them all the incipient parts of life that they want. And I'll let them have it millions of years, and they're still not going to get life. Because life isn't based on chemicals. Life is based on information. Without a computer code called the genome, you don't get living things, period. And any computer programmer will tell you that random keystrokes destroy computer programs. How do you get a tightly integrated, complex, interleave, multidimensional system from randomness? That's the wrong direction. So, the origin life scenario is you don't have a source of complex molecules. There's no way to get polymers. DNA, proteins, sugar chains, those are polymers. And when they form, they kick out of water as, as you link all the subunits together. The problem is if you take spaghetti and put it in water, it's going to turn into sugar. It will slowly break down into nothing. It'll turn into the gooey bleh, stuff, and eventually it'll be completely broken down into single sugars because Water destroys the bonds between sugars faster than they form. If you take sugar and put it in a pot and leave it sit there for a million years, you're not going to get spaghetti. <laughs> you might get a couple sugars that linked up to dimers. You'll get a couple of trimers. You maybe get four in a row. Maybe. But the reaction kinetics is in the wrong direction for origin of life and they have no way of getting instructions. So sorry, original life is dead in the water. Original life via God, though, makes lots of sense. All right, my last big illustration for you. I want you to imagine the smallest thing that you can see. All right, there's a speck of dust flo floating through the light beam or something like that, the smallest thing you can see. What's the biggest thing you can see that you know how big it is? Your house? Maybe you grew up on a mountain and your entire life you've walked all over this mountain every day so you know where every tree and every rock and every cave is and you've got a really good idea. That's, even that's kind of hard. What's the biggest thing you can know is actually kind of small? What's the fastest thing that you can notice? The blink of an eye, snap of a finger. What's the longest thing that you can notice? Maybe when you were born, your dad planted a tree in your front yard and that tree's been growing your whole life. Now you're an old person and you got this big old tree. That's it. That's your experience only. Now we built this thing called human history. And so we've linked all of human experience together and expanded our zone, if you trust history, back a few thousand years. 
We've also invented microscopes and telescopes and atomic clocks and things like that. So we've taken what humans can directly observe, we've surrounded that with a zone of instrumentation. And now we're stuck because we can't go as small as a quark and we can't get faster than the fastest atomic wiggle. And history only goes back a few thousand years, and then we're done. Then it's all extrapolation after that. There's no records. This is not the argument for creation evolution. There's the argument for creation evolution. It's outside of our direct observation and the zone of our instrumentation. And outside of that, there's only deductions. Lucky guesses, if you like. We don't know anything pretend that God doesn't exist. But look at Isaiah 46.10. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times. What is still to come, I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. How can God know the end from the beginning? Nothing surprises God, right? God knows everything that will ever happen. How can that be true? The only way is that God is outside of time. We're stuck in time. Everything God created, including the angels, including Satan himself, is stuck in time. Right? What did the demons say to Jesus? What if, um, have you come to torment us before our time? They're stuck on the arrow of time. And it only goes in one direction. And no, they're not multiverses. No, they're not multiple possible futures because God already knows the future. It's already set. That means that God is a multidimensional being. We are three-dimensional creatures trapped in a four-dimensional universe that's only going in one direction in the fourth dimension. God is outside of that. So imagine that the arrow of time and God can turn it like that. What happens? The end and the beginning are at the same time. Take that arrow and do that to it and time collapses to a point. And God can see all of time at the same instant. That's amazing. But it has to be true. Or God is not omniscient. But the definition of God is he's omniscient. Okay, one more little illustration. This is inside all of your cells. You have many millions of these. It's called ATP synthase. It's the world's smallest electric motor. But it doesn't use electrons. It uses protons, hydrogen nuclei, to turn. And as it spins, it's taking ADP, adenosine diphosphate. That's a molecule that doesn't exist in nature outside of living things. It's too highly reactive. And it's bonding it with a molecule called phosphate. Phosphate is very hard to find in the wild because phosphate will bond to any divalent metal ion, uh, iron 2 plus, magnesium 2 plus, and it forms an insoluble salt and falls out of solution. Phosphate, the reason why farmers put phosphate on their fields, the reason why Florida has gigantic holes in the ground from phosphate mines, because phosphate is a very important thing for farming. Phosphate is hard to find. This molecule, sorry, this machine made of multiple molecules, operates at nearly 100% efficiency. You produce about your weight of ATP every day, and you burn it up right instantly. The sugars that we eat are broken down to make ATP so that that thing, so that motor can turn to make ATP. But this motor is made of proteins that produce, that require a massive amount of ATP to produce. ATP is required to repair DNA. It's required to make messenger RNA from DNA. It's required to translate the messenger RNA into the protein itself. All those other proteins that are involved require ATP. So what came first? ATP, the most improbable molecule in the universe, essentially, or the ATP synthase enzyme, motor complex. This is a, like a three-way chicken and egg problem because you need the proteins, you need the ATP, you need the motor, 
you need all those proteins to be coded into the DNA, so this is a four-way, and hundreds of proteins are involved, this can't start by itself. But God creates life, winds it up, and lets go. And now we have living things. The naturalistic explanation for this is actually nonsensical. Psalm 139, 14, I praise you, for I fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And yet, so many people turn to naturalism as an explanation. This is Alvin Plantinga, not, not an atheist, but you know, on the fence. He goes, if you exclude the supernatural from science, then if the world of some phenomena within it are supernaturally create, caused, or some phenomena, as most of the world's people believe, you won't be able to reach that truth scientifically. Observing methodological naturalism, thus hamstring science by precluding science from reaching what would be an enormously important truth about the world. It might be that just as a result of this constraint, even the best science in the long run will end up with false conclusions. So even the philosophers understand these issues. William Provine, now dead, a brain cancer. As he's dying, he says, um, this is a, a Cornell University professor. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There's no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. What? What's evolution got to do with theology? It's got a lot to do with theology. Why does it say there's no free will? Because he thinks that every thought you have is preconditioned based on the genes you inherited from your fish and monkey ancestors. There's no ghost in the machine. Remember that, that police album from the 80s? We are spirits in the material world. Our spirits. Remember? All right, old people. <laughs> There's no ghost in the machine. You're just a machine. Whew. I'm sorry. That's a horrible way to live. Sad. Charles Darwin's autobiography. Thus, disbelief crept over me at a very slow rate, but it was at last complete. The rate was so slow, I felt no distress. I've never since doubted even for a second that my conclusions was correct. I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. What? For if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that the men who do not believe, and this includes my father, brother, and almost all of my friends, will be everlastingly punished. Now, pardon my French, and this is a damnable doctrine. What? Charles Darwin just consigned Christianity to hell itself because of eternal punishment? Notice also, Darwin is surrounded by atheists. Victorian society is full of atheists who had already rejected the God of the Bible. It took the rest of society another hundred years to get there, but they were already there. In fact, someone wrote... Um, the intelligentsia of Europe was post-Christian by 1780. 300 years later, look what we're dealing with, but Darwin again, following the same thought. A man who has no assured and ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God or future existence with retribution and reward, that's of course hell and heaven, can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow his impulse and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. That's called hedonism. Yeah, welcome to America 2022. Based thoroughly on evolutionary philosophy, where there is no free will, where there is no existence after life. That's true. Adam Sedwick was a uh, tutor of Charles Darwin, very influential man. This guy named the Cambrian era in the, uh, in the geologic column, like when multicellular life was first evolving. I mean, it, he didn't think that, but that's what they say now. Uh, Sedwick, a very important geologist. He reads the Dar Origin of Species. A month after the publication, he writes this to Darwin. I've read your book with more pain than pleasure. Ouch. Parts I've read with absolute sorrow because I think they're utterly false and grievously mischievous. You've deserted the true method of induction. And then he says, now he's talking here about the link between the physical and the spiritual, that old ghost in the machine arg argument. Were it possible, which thank God it is not, to break the link between the spiritual and physical, 
Humanity, my mind, would suffer damage that might brutalize it and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since his written records tell us of its history. That guy just predicted the 20th century, where more people died at the hand of atheistic governments than any other time ever. And I'm not just talking about the Jews, because Stalin killed 10 times more people than Hitler did, and Mao, and Pol Pot. And how could Stalin go to sleep at night knowing he just wrote an order that he knew would lead to the death of 10,000 people. He slept soundly because to him, killing people was no different than cutting the grass because they're just machines and there's nothing after life. But we have something better. Ephesians 2, and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. I know this talk about Jews and Gentiles but it's also talking about, in one sense, the dividing wall of hostility between us and our God, our Creator. And clearly the universe is created, therefore God exists. But if God exists, there's moral accountability. And there's things that we need to address scripturally, specifically. Now look, I know there's a lot of subject I did not cover. Um, I'm not gonna be able to cover them all, there's just not enough time. Hopefully, I pointed you in a direction. So if you want more information, where do you go? Well, first, read your Bibles. There's more answers to your questions than you realize in the Scriptures itself. And I've been constantly running to something like, oh, that answers that. Okay, done. And you don't quite realize until you actually get into it. Second, uh, go to creation.com. 15,000 articles, perfectly free. You can read to your dying breath, and you're not going to read everything we've ever written. There for you. But some of our stuff is a little old, so... We have out on the tables here a bunch of books, some DVDs and things like that. But someone's going to ask me afterwards, hey, Carter, what do you recommend? Someone's going to ask me that. So let me head that off the pass. Creation Magazine is what I recommend first. I know it's a family magazine, but I think this is the thing that God used to study me into Christianity when I was 19 years old. I was at Georgia Tech. I was barely a Christian. I was an evolutionist. And someone dragged me to Wyuka Road Baptist Church in Atlanta. And I didn't believe what that guy was saying, and now I am that guy. <laughs> but I remember bringing this magazine back to my dorm room, and there was an article in there about something I learned in biology class at Georgia Tech the day before. And I, I had no idea about the answer to that. The next page was something about geology I'd always wondered about. This is, I cannot believe I get to work for this organization. I mean, I've read Creation Magazine for 20 or more years before I actually came to work for the organization that makes Creation Magazine. I'm a second generation scientist here. The people who started this are now retiring or are dead. And I can't believe, I'm, I'm standing in some very big shoes. This magazine is there for you. Now, we offer it in two different ways. You can get it for one year, comes out quarterly, or you can get it for two years, very simple. If you sign up for a two year subscription, we will include the digital version of the magazine. We'll send you an email with a link. We want you to share this with other people. So, hey, Uncle Bob, remember that conversation we had over Thanksgiving? Yeah, well, check out page 22. I bet Bob and all his arrogance and resentment of Christianity will probably click on your dumb link and read page 22. Who knows what might happen? It's there for you. This is what our sign-up form looks like. Um, again, you just check off one year or two year, fill in the address because we have to mail it to you. And on the back, you'll see there's a place where you can um, write down for gift subscriptions. Just a little thing there. Four gift subscriptions, you can get your own for free, if you like. We're also going to throw in a copy of Darwin, The Voyage That Shook the World. This is um, a million dollar production, no joke. We went all around the world chasing Charles Darwin's footsteps in honor of his 200th birthday. And we made a one hour style TV documentary. In fact, we're the first people to go to Galapagos Islands with a high def camera. National Geographic was there the week after us in the same boat. Ha <laughs> ha, we beat you anyway. Um, <laughs> this is a, a really good presentation, but it's as neutral as we can make it. We designed it for secular TV. Well, the next movie we made was Evolution's Achilles Heels, and no, we didn't pull any punches for that one. For this one, we tried to tone it down. If we, anything negative said about Darwin, we let the evolutionists say it. I mean, did you know that the man was housebound from the age of 29 until he died? You know what agoraphobia is? He had a, uh, a, a bowl he would throw up in next to his desk. He said if, if a, a visitor had surprised him, he'd throw up for three days afterwards. 
He had his desk with his doors cracked, and he could look down the length of his mansion, and there's a full-length mirror right next to the front door, and when the door opened, he's Charles Darwin, and he's a very interesting and fascinating person. Uh, I'm also going to include something we call Fallout. It's a 35-minute mini-documentary. We took a TV camera all around uh, college campuses within a couple hours' drive of Atlanta, and we interviewed college students, and we asked them three questions. Did you go to church growing up? If they said no, we said, see ya. If they said yes, we said, okay. Were you ever taught about anything about creation and evolution? And the next question was, do you still go to church? Now, granted, statistics, right? You find people in all different categories, but we found a very strong trend. And that was that the churches that preach us from the pulpit, Sunday schools that discuss this, families that talked about this over the dining room table, they were raising young Christians who were much more willing to stand up for Jesus in a very hostile environment called the college campus. We found of all the kids who said they went to church and they had never taught anything about creation and evolution, only one of them said they were still going to church. All of the other ones, he's going to hand these out. If you don't get one before the end, just come to the tables. We'll take care of you there. Now, after some of your questions, that's why we wrote the book. There's a starter pack comes with a to refute a list of evidences for evolution the National Academy of Sciences put together. That's a powerful book. Here's evolution. Yeah, I'm the co-author on this book. I'm very proud of this. Uh, my co-author and I were going through um, if the Bible is true and Noah's flood is true, here's what we should see in the world with fossils and rocks and things like that. If you're interested in the question of deep time, I would highly recommend the deep time deception. Excellent book that, excuse me, that goes through the philosophy of it. Um, you know, carbon has shaped how Noah's flood shaped our earth is a very interesting book. I have several Genesis academies. I know someone here this morning said, oh, we went through that, it was really good. We set up a soundstage in our warehouse to professionally film 12 lectures on the first 11 chapters of Genesis. This is the most up-to-date, most modern production we've ever done. I wrote a study guide. You can get it on creation.com. Just type in study guides. It'll, it'll come up. It's designed for Sunday schools, uh, personal study, uh, small groups, you know, Wednesday nights, anything like that. And it's there for you. Here's geology, uh, exploring geology with Mr. Hibbs. Got a little cricket with Mr. Hibb. That's out there also. Uh, we also have a, no, we don't have a streaming service like Netflix or uh, Disney Plus, but we have most of our, especially all of our newer materials on our website for a very small fee. And in fact, this one is free, the historical atoms, theological conundrums and scientific implications. My lecture on Adam using genetics, and that's, that's one of the favorite things I've done. It's there, free, there's a couple of the free ones, and just a little bit of money for any number of different lectures on our website. Here's the high-tech cell, probably my favorite lecture I've ever given in my life trying to explain how the genome works, and I compare it to a computer, whoops, because that computer instantly became more complex than any computer humans have ever done. Just saying, that's there. But my, my purpose here is not to sell you books. That's not why I'm here. I'm trying to point you in a direction. The direction is, here's the answers, fill your minds. You don't have to be left hanging with these giant I don't know how to answer this, or this question is really troubling me, or I'm really doubting because of this. Well, there's an answer for that. Go get it. And I'm going to leave you as a promise. 1 Peter 3.15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. You do it with gentleness and respect. You think you can do that? I think so. You done? Your brains are full? Ready for lunch? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for telling us where things came from and where they're going. Thank you for giving a record of the before and the after, and you know the future. So therefore, what's written in the Bible, we're going to trust that you're coming back. But in the meantime, Lord, we're waiting. We're waiting patiently, and we're struggling with sin, and we're struggling with doubt, and we're struggling with just wasting so much time. This world keeps us so busy. Being impatient and yeah, very patient, God, because you haven't thrown us to the side like we deserve. So pick us up once more, dust us off, put us on our feet, give us swat in the behind if we need it, and just tell so many hurting souls 
There's so many people that need to hear about you. And if they don't talk to their friends and their neighbors, who will? So bless us all, Father, with an open mouth, Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's thank Dr. Carter. Thank you, sir, so much. Excellent. How many of you feel smarter as a result of the lecture? Yes. Um, I want to remind you of a couple things. First off, he mentioned the table. There are uh, two you can indicate if you'd like to give specifically to Creation Ministries International. Last thing is next Sunday is Baptism Sunday during the 11 o'clock service. Uh, 11 o'clock service at 1215. We're having a very special uh, interest session for those who are interested in learning more about Calvary, where we came from, what we believe, and where we're going.